Well, I turned 11, and you are 130, turning 131 in two days. So, when you were 11, what did you think you would be doing now? Welcome back to the final episode of Kino Summer Series for the season of 2024. I'm your host, the Kino Cowboy. I'm here with my co-host, Scott Keith. Today, we're doing a film that if I had seen at the right time when it came out, it would have been in my top of 2022, but I didn't see it until right after that, like January 2023 or such. But it was a movie that's been growing on me for the last year and a half. And I was like, I really need to rewatch this. It'd be perfect for summer series because it's extremely summer and also emotionally devastating to me. And um, I am quite interested to hear your first time watch takes because this is kind of a this is a movie that skirts between portraying memories on screen and as well as a lot of emotions that are complicated, but also quite simple. And footage and documented footage. Yeah. You know, we, we have memories. We can imagine that anything that's in a cinematic kind of your uh, a diegetic style, that's kind of the wrong way of saying it, but you know what I mean? Um, is her recollection, Frankie or Sophie, Frankie's the actress, her adult recollection of that, um, I, I thought it was great. I, you know, the first 20 ish minutes, I was not bored, but I was just, I was, I was getting into it cause it is a slow burn. I'm like, okay, okay. Where's this going? This is picking up. And I watched it and I continued to get more engrossed. And then the ending tied it all together. And even I want to point out the ending credits music. There's excellent use of music in this film. Yeah. And something about the score of the credits, it really hammered home the emotional weight of not, not just the ending, but the entire film. Um, and the more I thought about it, you know, I was sitting in my bed watching the credits roll and think, yeah, no, that, that was great. That was great. That, that was a ride. It was a almost an almost linear arc upward in terms of, emotionality you know i mean there are some dips and valleys of course but um it, it just keeps getting more intense and then doesn't fall there's no falling action it it which i don't it just ends but i i it works because there there is no closure because this is a, a woman trying to piece together her dad's life from her memories and some vacation footage that she had yeah. um and that that's it there's no closure as there is in life but that's all we really need and uh i woke up this morning and you know this is one of the first things i started thinking about when i woke up um i woke up early this morning you know i didn't sleep great not because of the movie but um <laughs> it, it was i was in that state and i was like no that that is a great movie it's a very impressive directorial debut one of the more impressive directorial debut for a feature yeah it I've helps seen. that it's just so deeply emotional and personal to the director yeah i i've heard it's an excerpt it's a, it's mentioned in tarkovsky's sculpting in time uh his book on on filmmaking and his process and he talks about the power of filmmaking in a subliminal sense um because this definitely is is it's a most it's mostly linear but there's some non-linear elements to the story um and you can definitely say it is that uh, it reminds me of other directors that we've covered like tarkovsky like terrence malik where so much of the editing comes into telling the story even yeah. more so than not just in the sense of establishing continuity in your sort of classic hollywood editing style but in, in the way it is able to juxtapose emotions and flip through time 
even if we know that this entire scene is set in the past, I can tell from the way it's shot and cut how it is a memory, you know, and how the memory is being felt by adult Sophie um, in, in certain scenes. And, and yeah. it just reminds me of something in, you know, we've covered mirror on this and it uh, reminded me of mirror in that way. It reminded me of mirror, you know, that it reminded that, me of mirror in that way. And then of the Florida project in the way that it yes. frames childhood perspective with serious things going on in the background that you can't quite comprehend. Right. Absolutely. Cause so much of this is there are times where she doesn't seem to realize the gravity of some certain things with her father. She's starting to, uh, you know, she's older. 11's an interesting age. I was definitely, you, you know, it, it's, you're starting to edge your way into puberty. Yes, 11 people. was the perfect age for this setting because it's when you really start to first figure out the formation of certain thoughts and ideas and how maybe the world works just a little bit. Right. And, and, and it's there's definitely like throughout the whole movie, especially with her overhearing the older girls talk about sexuality and things like that. Just these things you can tell she doesn't fully understand, but she's, she's at that age where now she's interested and she's paying. She, she has, attention. she has an idea that they're talking about sex, even yeah. though, it's, you know, alluded to and mimed somewhat. I'm not going to do the motion on camera. Um, but uh, what, what I was saying with Tarkovsky, I kind of got off topic, but like he, he says like, if you shoot something that's important to you and has an emotional resonance, and you're honest about that, it yeah. will somehow transmute itself through the medium of cinema and communicate that importance to the audience. Even if I don't know what that image denotes, I will understand what it connotes. If you're a pure filmmaker, you know, yes. if, if you're I totally really committing to it. And, and, um, cause you know, and I was hearing Richard Linklater talk about this and, and he's another one of those who, you know, I, I can just tell when he shoots certain things. Um, yeah, with something like boyhood, even like why um, certain things have emotional resonance, almost not needing any context. You know, I, I just know. And it's to the strength of this. I knew within the first few minutes of this film that it was autobiographical. I just knew you yeah. could feel it. You know, it's too real. It's too naturalistic. Although there's because it deals with memory, there's a surrealist tone to some of it as well in the way it travels through you know time and stuff um but but it's so honest and so naturalistic and so grounded i'm like this this is not a story somebody made up because it's too simultaneously too simple and too nuanced you know it, it feels so goddamn real i don't know how you could make something like this up. and such a great example of having to look back at your memories as a kid and realize the context later on and uh fill in the holes yourself because now you have an adult's perspective and sometimes that can be pretty brutal. And this replicates that I feel because we are the adults watching this back with her at the same time, pretty much. And uh, watching it the second time, it's just that much more devastating. Cause yeah. What, what was the second time? Like, I want to hear that. I, was crying within like three minutes of the movie <laughs> really because <laughs> i had i feel the emotional connection to the main girl so much that like even if i i don't know anyone or have any family members that have killed themselves or anything i just you feel the emotional weight so hard that like just the opening sequence of the memories being rewound via videotape or digital videotape it just like immediately got me and you're almost desperate on the second watch looking for more clues as to what might have unraveled for this guy to get to where he is. But it's the same thing on the second watch. It's it's there. There's no closure because no, it, it's really realistic in that way and sad in that way. But that's just how it is. No, it's. um. I And I, I can relate to this. So I, I don't have a parent. Um. Yeah, so the guy Callum, very Scottish name. Just call him Dad. Uh, no, Callum. It's it's Scottish and beautiful. Um, and I'm a Scot. Uh, so uh, 
I, I am by ancestry, but I'm yeah. a, a bourbon guy because I'm American. So uh, scotch can get anyway, I'm getting off topic. The <laughs> um, I, I didn't have to use subtitles as much as with train spotting. So my grasp of the English language has gotten better. There were some times where they were muttering and I was like, oh, God, I feel like such a stupid American right now. <laughs> but, I've, no I've noticed that's like one of the things that I have somehow I'm just able to not have a problem with that with like uk accents I don't some, know. with scottish in particular it can be difficult for me um it almost got bad with attack the block that was pretty dead. oh I, I didn't have a lot of problem with attack the block because it was just like you know street british just yeah and that's very hardcore so uk that, hearing that because in the movie chav speak yeah, yeah. <laughs> chav speak <laughs> so it makes me feel better when i have trouble with somebody's spanish accent i'm like well this is my native language and i have trouble understanding this <laughs> accent so yeah. like if i meet like a honduran and i'm not used to their accent in spanish i'm like okay that's fine yeah. um, <laughs> it's like that doesn't mean i'm stupid um no i, I i'm guessing yeah uh callum killed himself uh that that's your theory that seems to me the most logical thing yeah no he's does it does it outright say that no, to me it's just that's what it was all pointing to yeah because he has he has all those postcards or letters to sophie um saying like i'll love you and stuff and he's sobbing because there, there's a moment where he's sobbing right after she sings happy birthday which that is one of the biggest emotional roller coasters of the movie that scene in particular because it, it's very hard to like I've, I've dealt with depression and even just being around other family members and younger family members like my niece or my little cousins and stuff they get a sense of something if I'm depressed at a family function yeah. you know, like they're, they're not able to fully put it together and it's a terrible thing because I don't know how to explain it to a kid, especially it's it's not my kid, which I have the luxury of that. <laughs> um, it's also a reason I'm hesitant to have kids is because I Me feel too. like that. Yeah. Also, the world's uh, getting, you know, melting. Um, but uh, it, her going around to a bunch of strangers telling them to sing for he's a jolly good fellow, not happy birthday, which... Uh, but yeah, but you know, it's British such a equivalent. beautiful. Well, you know, it's got to point out. Um, it's such a beautiful thing and such a kind thing and childlike, and the fact that everybody went along with it, which I do think is fairly realistic. If because this kid, Sophie Frankie Corio, who plays Sophie, is super cute. She's perfectly cast as like cute, intelligent, a little precocious. You know, really uh, good. Yeah, yeah. Wimsk no, it, it's great. It's an all time. It's like a top five child performance in a movie to me um and uh it is realistic that if, like a kid that cute was like hey, hey sing happy birthday for my dad people would be like yeah okay because you know they're hanging out in turkey it's all relaxed um yeah doing their turkey i really want that turkish mud bath though I yeah really me too i'd go in yeah. that oh yeah I, I would totally exfoliate myself and stuff um and it, but it immediately cuts to he's on these steps it looks like a pyramid and he's you know clearly I know that personally of being depressed and kind of separating yourself from the family function or being at the fringes of a family function um, or, or vacation, you know, uh, and not knowing how to reinsert yourself in that environment. And when people reach out to you, you don't know how to react. And we don't really see how he reacts, but we immediately cut to him sobbing in his room which at first I thought it might have been later that night, but looking back at it, I think it was, you know, maybe years ahead when he was really in his darkest moment. And probably from his point of view, looking back at his own memory of that scene. Oh, I disagree there. You disagree? Yeah. You, do you think it was that I think night? it's there. No, very much to me. This is the last time she ever saw her dad and the way he puts the camera down and walks at the very end of the film into that dreamlike abyss. That was like the way she waves and it stops on him, her waving to him to the camera through that lens. To me, that is like the final time she saw him. That's the goodbye. And I you're think probably he, you're probably right. I think he could only hold on through the vacation. You, you don't you don't think it was even a couple months later? No, not at all. Actually, yeah. You think it was like within that month? Yeah. No, I think oh. it's right after, like right after this. Yeah, th that was his goodbye. Um, because 
and and one of the interesting things in this movie it, it's so he clearly had this child very young and it threw off yeah. his life he even said i didn't even expect to make it to 30 um she was born you know probably out of wedlock they were probably drunk at some party and hope you know like millions of people um and that does affect it, it does make me think of my my own mom was born to a teen mom and this was you know back in the 60s when in arkansas when that was verboten um but i that that affected you know their relationship um because i and maybe i'm projecting but there's almost callum has i don't want to use the word resentment um because that sounds too strong but maybe a similar emotion towards a child for stealing his own youth yeah uh, which i think is very common it's people. there i yeah. cannot be denied no it, it can't it cannot be denied you know even though he clearly loves her and yeah. he's built up his life but, but he's you know so lost dealing with whatever you know which we don't see um there's probably repressed sexuality in there um i i feel like callum could be do you think he could be bisexual I don't know. Because, I, do. I mean, we, we see, for instance, we see her look at um, these two guys making out, I think, in the laundry room of that yeah. resort, um, which is right after or soon after when she kisses that boy for the first time, which I feel like part of that is her exploring her own sexuality. And she wasn't really into it um and into this really like dorky looking British yeah. kid. What and I mean that in in the way like the way it's cast and the way he's costume and his haircut is everything is that dorky late 90s sort of or early aughts um chubby, you know, like a lot of kids who kind of they'll get chubby right before puberty and then they'll kind of shoot up. Um <laughs> and, and she even has her eyes open cuz kids are banging on the windows messing with them. Um, which actually happened uh, in my first kiss, but it was with like an old Mexican man at the Mexican restaurant, and I was nineteen in my car. He was cool. That was really funny. I was yeah, like, you kissed guy. an old Mexican man. Yeah, I kissed an old Mexican man. No, no, he just banged. that's how it sounded. He just knocked on the window with me and my girlfriend, and he's like, "Hey, what's up? Uh, we're closed," <laughs> but in a funny way. I was like, "That guy's." Cool. I still think about that guy. I hope he's doing all right. Um, <laughs> but, um. But it, it feels that thing like she's, you know, barely knows his kid. And this kid's, you know, when you're a kid, you get crushes for the stupidest reasons. I still do. But you get you get crushes like, oh, this girl's kind of cute. We're on vacation. It's this cute and cool environment. And we played this motorcycle game together. Um, but I'm sure even then she got a sense like, oh, I don't know if I'm actually into this. into Or am I into, not into this boy? Or am I not into boys? in general yeah um and, and i guess i'm maybe i'm reading too much into it but that scene on the boat where he talks to that guy when they're diving um when he had apparently lied about his diving certification or whatever um and i want to talk more about that scene because there's foreshadowing in that scene as well um there's subtle foreshadowing all through this movie um he, he's talking to this younger guy about everything and it feels like there's almost sexual tension i might be reading too much into that uh because we do see people's bodies but it, it's a lot in this movie you know and there's a lot of her looking at like older teen bodies but not even in a in a sexual way um it, it has to do with sexuality but not sex and sensuality yes. but not sex yes um it just has to do with like burgeoning puberty noticing your body's changing looking at the teenagers noticing how they're different yep. you know um which is you know i remember at, at this age you were like com comparing armpit hair in your head with like other people and i'm sure with young girls it's all about like breasts and uh if you know wondering when my leg hair was gonna start growing <laughs> yeah yeah just all kinds of stuff like, especially because like you you would have that kid who had a mustache at twelve, and you'd be kind of <laughs> jealous of him, even though it looks terrible in hindsight. You'd be like that that just looked really awkward, but you were like jealous at the time. Oh yeah, I remember I started getting a crust stash at thirteen, but I, I was would. told to get rid of it. But um, <laughs> I just remember when um, we went. I got to eleventh grade, 
and Chris Tolson had a full beard, and I was like, "What the hell? How do oh, you?" Oh yeah, no, this? you would you would get those few people in in their sophomores or juniors, and they have I was full like, beard. "How the hell do you have go this buy beard? cigarettes for other people?" Yeah. And stuff. <laughs> like you look like a mountain man. I was like, "What the hell, dude?" Uh, but um, and also growing up, yeah, because I grew up at a pool. My grandparents owned a swim club for 30 years and i lived there so <laughs> i had a lot of those like memories of b11 12 starting budding sexuality you know like seeing <laughs> the but girls like in the cars. pool like hmm i think i might like this <laughs> you, you didn't uh you didn't do a sandlot and fake your own drowning oh to- i never did that <laughs> and uh, i was actually a prick to the lifeguards a little bit as a kid because it's like well my grandparents own this place you're not going to put me a timeout i'm just going to go upstairs and play video games and come back down later oh you're you're the do you know who my father is well no i didn't use it like that to like kids <laughs> but like i wasn't gonna let these teenagers that are four or five years older than me try and boss me around like my mom <laughs> it, it is insane how it, it's kids like teenagers will seem so much older than you just in that like five older. years like how much yeah. you grow it from yeah 12 to 17 and then like, if i meet somebody who's three four years older younger than me now it's no big deal yeah crazy but i'm callum's age he turns it's his 31st birthday in this yeah week. I, I turned know. 31 a month ago i know I um, almost exactly that. one month ago um, but we're both child free thankfully Oh yeah, no, thank God. Uh, I know how to pull out, and by that I mean I don't get late. Um, but it's I do sometimes. I, it's not ever. Um, I I want to talk more about the foreshadowing of. There's a sense of dread creeping throughout the movie, and it's subtle. But well, to me, it's pretty, especially on the rewatch. It's. He's trying his best, but he knows that the vacation is kind of like a final hurrah for himself. And it really feels like he's using it as just one more distancing mechanism, one more like waiting period because he doesn't, I don't know, but he, he breaks a few times and it's really sad when he does, but it's the fact that he, has those postcards from the trip ready and it's i think the whole thing is emphasized because right after he's sobbing he's it's clear that he was trying to hold out until the end of the vacation and now that it that because at this point the vacation is finally coming to a close he has to face reality again I think this is emphasized in the scene directly after it, where his daughter says she wishes that the vacation could go on longer. Why can't we just stay here? We can just live in hotels. You know, it's wishful thinking. Even she thinks it's wishful thinking, but it just reads as like delaying the inevitable. Right. Well, and that's, that's the kid sensing something is wrong, wanting to reach out to help and also yeah. just wanting to spend more time. Cause he's not a bad dad at all. Um, He's, he isn't, you know, he's not perfect, but you know, I don't watch this and be like, yeah, that guy's a shitty dad. Um, he, he's doing his best. He's which trying is, his best. Yeah, which is all you can do. Um, and th- there's a lot of things I'm just now putting it together with uh, what you said. Like, this is his last hurrah. It's a, um, it's a fantastic and, rewatch. And no, I bet. Um, I, I wish I had time to rewatch it again. Um he spends a hundred or eight, I'm sorry, 850 pounds. Yeah. Which in with inflation, who knows how much that is in exchange rates, a well over a thousand um, yeah. on a rug, which as beautiful as Persian rugs, handmade Persian rugs are, I can't imagine. I would have to make like eight figures to spend that much on a fucking rug, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, that's probably that person's rent for like six months. <laughs> uh, but it's only 850 bucks. Yeah. No, I'm just saying with the exchange, I know. the Turkish, whatever currency they use. Um, now, I'm sure that place is pretty expensive for the resort town, but it, it's he's clearly just lies down on it almost like he's trying to merge with it, become one with the earth. And it's it's all this Islamic or Islamic inspired art. It's spiritual in that nature as well with these Persian rugs. Um. But he clearly can't. And and, and his his uh Sophie even comments like 
promising to buy him stuff or talking about buying her stuff. She knows he can't afford, but he's like, I'm not, you can't take it with you. He doesn't say that. Um, yeah. He tries. Cause um, you're wondering why he's so focused on this rug. And I don't know, maybe he, he's, he wants to feel good. He wants to spend something on something he finds to be, you know, cool. He's, I don't know. He feels like maybe he, he's at the end of his rope. He doesn't really care. I don't know. Yeah, but... And it's, it's, he finds it beautiful. Yeah. Um, and it's probably one of those that he, it speaks to him. It probably they... reflects on, cause he's really trying. Cause he's, you see his books of like spirituality and like Tai Chi. He's been trying Tai Chi and different things. You can tell he's desperately trying to fight against these creeping feelings. And it makes it really, sadder because it's obviously just not enough even when he tries to teach her and show her some of the movements of tai chi and stuff like that he wants a better life for himself but it's just too heavy hitting and that's what really gets me we you know both of us have battled pretty heavy depression for our whole lives at least my whole life and so I get overwhelmed sometimes when I see such a accurate but tragic display of depression taking hold of somebody like that. Somebody that in the film you get a clear sense of their inner person on about like when he's dancing at the end on vacation, that's like the clearest shot you get of like his inner self without being bogged down by anything. Just when he's when he's dancing to under pressure. Yeah. Which itself, that's an interesting choice of song. Cause it is this catchy radio tune, but like a lot of pop songs, if you listen to the lyrics, it's it's about the pressure of modern life and modern society. Well, also it's literally while yeah. they're dancing together, it's literally saying, This is our last dance. Yes. So it's the final that, final that. time. Um, and it's also interesting. She picks of all things REM's "Losing My Religion," which I always thought was an interesting song. I'm not a huge REM fan, but that song is so. Even though it's ostensibly sort of a love song, which are dime a dozen, it plays on the radio, but it's a very melancholy song. Yeah, and it, it's an interesting song for an 11 year old to pick. And I, I have to imagine it's a band or a song that. Callum liked at one yes, point and maybe definitely. introduced her to and she's trying to reach out and the guy he's just too depressed you know he, he's yeah, even he, he's she's just trying to be like them up for karaoke and he's almost like aren't you too old for this even though people of all ages like drunk old people it's just having fun on vacation with your kid it's not yeah yeah but, but he, he just can't but um yeah he's so in trouble mentally that he can't even get up there and like even fake his way through karaoke with his daughter. And do, I, I know that happened in the director's life in Charlotte Wells. Like that, ha that has to have happened. That's that one of those thing. really I, distinct things that sticks. No. And, and the fact, the choice of song and how specific that's the thing. This movie's so goddamn specific yeah. in every detail. Like if she came out and was like, yeah, we danced to Under Pressure by David Bowie on vacation. Even if it wasn't the last night, it was like at some point on vacation. Yeah. I can't listen to that song anymore. I I would be completely unsurprised. Yeah. And imagine that's the case. And then you're as the filmmaker having to listen to this song a hundred times while you watch the edit and stuff. It's like brutal. God damn. It's like right after that, when he go, she's, doing it by herself and then she comes up and he says he kind of wants to make up for it and say you know if you're interested in singing i'll buy you singing lessons and she says she knows he doesn't have the money for right. that which is know. also just him trying to connect um because i i do wonder if if you have to grow up that fast do you lose perspective because your own development was cut short that you have to grow up fast. So not only are you figuring out your own development, you have to figure out a child's development. And so it, it makes connecting harder in a way. Um, if that makes sense. I, yeah. I also think the idea of taking an 11 year old to a vacation in Turkey, which I know is pretty common for um, 
you, you know, Brits, uh, Scottish people, people from the UK um, to go there. But when I think of vacations to take an 11 year old to Turkey is not on the top 100, probably <laughs> uh, locations. Uh, and she's one of the only kids there. You know, the other people we see some like, how old do you think those teenagers are? I don't know what the drinking laws because they the have drinking beer. laws 16. Yeah, it's 16, right? So Turkey, I, so they're probably 16 to 18, I'd yeah, say. That's what I was I was thinking 16 to 18. Um, yeah, you can have beer at 16. You can have wine, yeah. wine, wine coolers, beer, and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. And then I, it looks like they sh- snuck some, you know, Jaeger or Meister or whatever. And one one time she's watching them through the glass party, wanting to join them. But there are know. a lot of moments where she's peering in on all other things. And it's a pretty obvious framing of adolescence, but it's still interesting the way they shoot it. Yeah, because it works perfectly for cinema. That is the language of cinema. Cinema in itself, it's voyeuristic inherently. Yeah. But yeah, as we peer into her mind, it's you know, it's the shit. It's the shit, right. man. But we're but we're able to do it subjectively. And that's that um, the thing. This movie, it's 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 a little difficult to talk about because there there's so many small details, and the plot is almost threadbare. But the story is there, if that makes sense. Um, it's yeah, not like well, we're talking I about Die Hard with a Vengeance. We're there talking. are context clues of, I this is like a all inclusive kind of like mid budget resort. I think that's what he could afford. Yeah, and they they go to the the sea, the ocean a little bit, but like that there's plenty enough for them to do. I think he found one of those like cheap vacation packages. That's why it's in Turkey, and then uh, yeah, yeah. But it, it's also that and like. She knows he doesn't have money for this or that. And I'm wondering if he's had instances of sporadic spinning behavior or something. Cause obviously him and the mom aren't together for whatever reason. Right. And, and he, he talks about, doesn't he talk yeah. about failed business ventures? Yeah. You get bits and pieces of his life through her asking about that girl. If he's still seeing her and he says, no, she's seeing someone else. And then she says, oh, you're not doing the cafe thing now like genuine and he he the way he responds it's clear that he had already forgotten about that prospect and he is like already on to whatever next prospect because he's like oh no 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 and then um then he says he's got something with keith scott keith and then um he's he's having this like idea of oh well if it goes well i'll have this house in london and you can have a room in there it it sounds endearing but it also sounds like something you tell your kid because you're insecure about your actual process is and life. there's there's a lot of divorced dad energy in it you know yeah a lot of stepdad energy um and there again there's that perspective sophie senses it as you're making promises you can't keep because maybe you're trying to w- just make me happy or win my affection although she he already has her affection but um but she doesn't understand the whole context, which is why she's looking back at these memories and recontextualizing every piece of information, yeah. which everybody does. It's yeah, this movie freaking rules. I, um, oh, I wonder what she's going to make next, because I know she's done some shorts. Oh, if, I'm begging to know what she's going to do next, which she's which have so also um, have, uh, you know, in- involved this. I think it took an even more autobiographical tone with this so i wonder what she's gonna do now if she has other trauma in her life she's gonna unearth her i could see her keeping it sort of semi-autobiographical um if i'm just speculating like not in that she would make another one as strictly autobiographical as this but you know i mean she's a queer woman who you know came of age at a time when it was and we're still experiencing it but that last hurrah of homophobia um, I don't know when gay marriage got legalized in the UK, but before us, I'm pretty sure. Um, we were at 2014. 15. But it wasn't even like, it was just the very beginning of the budding of the seed that would plant in her head about different things regarding her sexuality. Yeah. Uh, she's looking at bodies, including so many bodies. formative things in this film, just from observing, simply her observing as all these formative things. And um, the framing device, the partial framing device is so interesting because it's of this the, the dreamscape club. club 
and it just slowly builds up. You see flashes of her past and then glimpses of her dad in this club dancing, but it's so like you really have to squint your eyes and, and try and uh, see what she's seeing. Which is right, cool. because that's how memory is. It's all yeah. reconstructed, you know. Um, so you, okay, he's really... Real place. Huh? I think that club was a real place. No, I just think it's uh, some sort of mindscape thing. I, I do too, but I also think it could represent um, Callum when he was away from Sophie. I, I could definitely see him as a guy, because he, he references doing drugs. He's like, you can tell me anything. I've done it all. Um, and he um you know that's probably how she was conceived so i feel like he was a guy who clubbed a lot and probably still does to escape his depression not on the vacation i know yeah no. there was a little bit where i thought like oh is he going away at night and doing that and i don't think he is no Um, no he's just he did come home butt naked which is another one of those things as a like if that happened to me as a kid, I might be like, oh, haha, that's weird. But looking back, or like, oh, no. There that's- is a very slight tinge of awkwardness in that area. I don't know if she was trying to comment too hard on it. But it does have, like, the first scene in the hotel, he's mad that the, she he paid for a room for with two beds. And, yeah, it's annoying to have to share a bed, but there's nothing wrong with sleeping next to your child. No, but, I would be irritated, too. To be I know, honest. but it just it's interesting that it focuses there, I think. And he gets a tiny bed for himself because he – and he sleeps on the tiny bed and gives her the big bed, which is a nice thing as a parent to do. But, like, I'd definitely be like, you're sleeping on that tiny bed. <laughs> <laughs> like, but there is something just slightly there, and it's not – I'm not suggesting anything. I'm just – I just know – this is very complex emotionally and it's like slightly like, there. What in what way? Just like weird feelings of like being one-on-one with your dad and he's your dad, but like, you know, you don't want to see your dad naked and you know, I don't know. Yeah, especially just, if you're a daughter and yeah, it's just a little bit different, I'm sure. And I don't know. And she doesn't like to hear him talk about women when she, when he asks about, the teacher if she's good right looking, which I, which i think is also that's and part of that's just a kid thing of like ooh, grown-ups ooh. i mean first of all i don't want to think i still i'm not a child i still don't want to think about my parents sexuality uh I, well but, yeah but uh yeah if you if you heard your dad was crushing on your teacher and you were 11 yeah that would rock your world you'd be like what <laughs> uh, bro uh, what um unless you really like, though he does have problems with parenting just a bit because they're at first it's fine they play pool doubles with those young guys and of course the young guy's like oh how old's your sister and he's like that's my daughter of course that starts to hammer in the Mm -hmm. themes but it's later on that he i guess after he doesn't want to do karaoke and they kind of like have a bit of a almost the start of an argument and then he says let's go get an early night she said no i'm staying instead of being the assertive dad he just lets her stay out yeah that's a resort that's 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 crazy that's serious depression you know yeah goes out and sort of half-assedly looks for her later that's where it gets really intense because she's just hanging out with these teenagers they're drinking and stuff it's it's Thank God nothing happened. And you kind of get a tease of that when she gets like startled by that boy. Thank God. Right. Which adds to the sense of creeping dread. Yeah. Um, Which you also see, I'm going to, I'm going to say this real quick. When he dives underwater, apparently without a real diving license and and she's filming it, joking about it, not knowing where he's going to show up. Yeah. And she's like, bye, 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 dad. She keeps saying that that's foreshadowing. And yeah. there's a couple of other times. One of the times I remember the way it's shot, it looks like he almost walks in front of a bus. And if I remember correctly, the bus kind of hard breaks to stop. And I, I think it's one, I mean, hell, I've even done this, which I hate, where I kind of don't care about my own life. And it's that passive suicidal ideation. Yeah. Where I don't care so much about crossing the street because if somebody hits me, fuck it. You know, um, it's, it's then I'm somebody else's problem instead of my own problem. Um, which, even if it wasn't trying to say that he was, like, uncaring about that, maybe he was just sort of being reckless. It's, uh, still, it's still foreshadowing the way. It's, no, because it, it's, it's to me, this is, like, when it 
escalates pretty hard because to let your 11 year old just stay out. Yes. You're that, that, and that escalates. You're far and, gone. That, and that's one. And that's yeah. Cause imagine if you're, if, if my dad on a vacation, let me just stay out at 11 as a kid, I would think that's cool. You know, uh, maybe not with, I was that. too sheltered to I, even know what to do. Yeah. And not, not with the actions that preceded it with arguing with his dad and stuff, but, um, it, it, it's one of those things, uh, that in hindsight, I would be like, yeah, what the hell was my dad thinking? But it's right after this. Cause it hits like a brick right here for me. Cause that's the scene right after this, while she's out, he just walks straight into the ocean. It's this long shot of him just walking straight to the ocean. And it hits like a brick because if you've ever had very heavy thoughts and have felt hopeless, you know what it's like to have it feel it creeping towards you where it's about to consume you. And it's hard not to get swallowed whole. And this shot is like him being swallowed whole to me. Right. Um, no, it has meaning. Enveloped on- by the ocean completely in a way that's like, you're, I, I was so, the first time I watched that, I was like, oh, wow, this is it. But he shows he he finds his way back out obviously that's why he's naked in the hotel room because he stripped off his wet clothes because he went in without a care he, he right I don't know. and he um no because it has multiple meanings it has that it's it's him being enveloped him trying to wash off his emotion in in some way and then also that call to the void of like well this is dangerous but i don't really care what happens um it has all three of those layers it feels like he's walking into the unknown, which is what will happen if you commit suicide. And I think, I feel like it's a direct parallel yeah. of like, simu- almost him wanting to like simulate what that would be like. Mm-hmm. But it's, yeah. So there are clues in there, but there's more obvious ones. If you pay attention, there's a point where he has his towel over his face but he's if you listen he is holding in his cries earlier in the film and he lets out one noise and then it cuts and that's kind of like your first kind of inclination of like he's a little worse off than you realize and then there's a part where they play it very carefully with the tone and because there's a scene where he's standing on the balcony's ledge and his arms are out and it kind of just seems like a guy who's maybe feeling spiritual, feeling free, feeling reckless and crazy, but it's also like, well, or is this leaning towards the other way, but it stays on the fence, just like he's balancing on the railing uh, tonally in that scene. So it does a good job of making you kind of uh, play along as if you're an 11 year old, not really fully understanding things in that way. Uh, Yeah. But, um, and he apologizes for the day before in the mud bath. So he's still trying even after like, it, even after all of this, after we see him so far gone walking into the ocean, he's, I don't know, uh, for him to apologize. It's even more sad to me that he's just trying even then. You got to hold it together. And I, I, I've had, I've heard parents talk about they have a kid and they just think well suicide's off the table now you know i've, I've heard multiple people. yeah and there was a less mature version of me 10 years ago that would have called him a coward but it's just because i was i don't know what for for being a father who committed suicide yeah now there, there's a point where like you have to understand we're programmed to survive at pretty much all costs so something like you are inherently broken if you successfully commit suicide like yeah is not and that's not a judgment call of saying broken i'm just saying at at some fundamental spiritual psychological biological level something has to be irreparably or at least seemingly irreparably broken for that uh because i've done things i haven't i haven't i have stood on the edge of things and wondered like what if I jump off right now? That sort of call of the void. That that's just natural, I think, to everybody. Like you drive past people. <laughs> natural to maybe you and I. I don't know about everybody. No, no. There's a there's a French term for it that's called the void of just like or like you're driving or like what if I run into this person or like what if I just like crash my car into this you know 
concrete divide, you know, stuff like that. That are these intrusive thoughts. But I've also had times where, where I've driven recklessly. I, if I've been depressed, I've driven recklessly just to see how it feels like and stuff like that. Yeah, I. Uh, it was a dark humor kind of thing in my head, but the other night I was like. It'd be kind of funny if I just stabbed myself in the chest with this cake knife in front of everybody. It, <laughs> like that would have been crazy, huh? That would change the trajectory. Oh, hilarious! Hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> no, I shouldn't have said that on camera. But you can um, edit it out. You edit this. anyway, <laughs> speaking of what, how does this make you think of your father? We can edit no, this. Yeah, out. that is the thing. It's like I'm a oh, man. I didn't. I you know. I. Do you want to talk about this? No. What I'm saying is that, that is the one of the connections I did have is like, no, my dad didn't commit suicide, but I do have a complicated, very complicated past with my dad that I am still at 30 years old, still piecing together old memories, recontextualizing things, even having to dust off memories that I had pressed down for a long time. So you think after a certain time, like you would have decompressed everything, gotten everything, figured everything out. But even now, it's just like. Just no, it never happens. Time. And the, the idea of trying to understand your parents, it, it's I don't even fully understand myself. I understand myself better than I understand pretty much anybody else who's not me. But can a man truly ever know himself? And if yeah. they can't know themselves, how, how can they know anyone else, you know? I mean, first of all, we have to define self, which is a whole nother philosophical conversation <laughs> I'm not getting yeah. into. Um, you know, not, I'm, I'm sober. I'm not ready for that conversation. <laughs> you know, if I, yeah, give me some mess. Yeah, maybe if he would have just watched him and Gillian, he would have been all right. It, 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 it's, it's one of those, you know, <laughs> in Evangelion. Um, yeah, I'm like, man, this guy should have escaped and just started making a movie podcast for a <laughs> movie YouTube channel. Yeah, oh, it's just like niche cinephiles. <laughs> <laughs> it's just crushing right after w the mud bath. And he sits with her and he says he wants her to know that she can talk to him about whatever as she gets older. Clearly, he wished probably someone was there to do that for him when she when he was coming of age and made a lot of stupid mistakes. And it's just crushing because it feels like. Because it's it's one of the last few days of the vacation. It feels like more of a denial. Like he's in denial about what's going to happen. It is, but and I think I think it's also him communicating. Like he can, these both can be true at the same time. Yeah. That he knows he's not going to be there for it, but he knows that if he was there, that he would be there for her emotionally. Yes, he would be there to listen to and not judge her for anything and that was his way of extending love yes i'm trying and i'm trying to think does he ever say i love you to sophie throughout this whole movie i don't know if those exact words are exchanged but it's no it's him trying to say that in so many other ways but it really on rewatch it really that scene it just felt like he was almost doing this as like a way to manifest himself to being around longer and like a right. last ditch effort kind of thing and like the fact that he can't even crack a smile when everyone's singing, he's a jolly good fellow, whatever. That that had me fucking like emotional. It's as brutal. Hell. Yeah, and like you ha you have to face reality again. That's what's it's coming down to. And so, the emotion of this film can be so complex yet so simple. Like, why would my dad abandon me? Why would he do this? And then other feelings like I miss him yet resent him. And, and these can all be valid things all at the same time. And the way that he, she kind of sees this glimmer of his true self as he dances and all of these motions that have bubbled up now start hitting all at once as the music amplifies and they're a swirling around just like the dancer. Like it's just, that's when Bowie's lyrics come up and really knock you in the head. Like, yeah. this is their last dance. I, I, I was just YouTubing like trailers and, you know, interviews with the actors, yeah. doing research as usual. And there were multiple videos that are like reacting to the under pressure scene. It ruined me and stuff like, oh, in the end of this. Um, That's not how we should be consuming. It, was, it wasn't as cheesy as that. 
there was also a video essay explaining like what does the liminal space dance scene mean in the movie it's like "Ah, it's just watch it um (laughs) which yeah i don't don't know you're watching this and we appreciate it what a fun way to close out the summer series guys i hope your summer has been as as fun filled as a turkish vacation but it's such like um we see like right before this sequence we see her wake up next to her wife and step onto the carpet that he bought on this vacation. She still has. So there's surely some resentment there that he quote unquote abandoned her, you know, but there's a lot of mixed feelings, a lot of complications. Obviously she kept the carpet. So, you know, and then, It's right after that that we get his final goodbye, whether he realizes or not. But it's it's all through. I like that his before I thought it was just going to end on her waving and then freeze frame or something, which would have been cool. But it's the fact that she's waving goodbye to him and it's it's taking her forever because she's being a silly kid. And it's even like he's been waiting until the end of this vacation before he gives up. And it's even this last moment with her is still going on so long because she's just being silly and playing around and waving goodbye multiple times. And then she finally gets onto the plane and um, we get the final scene of adult Sophie turning off the video camera and then it pans. And then we get his perspective of him shooting the final sequence and it's already over. He's, already in this liminal space and he closes the video and walks in. And uh, I think that's just a great way to signify that. Like that was the end for him. I think it was right. Like after this vacation, that was it. I don't think it it was anything after that. Yeah. Personally. And I was surprised certain people that I know that usually can understand film pretty well. When I brought up, the suicidal stuff in this movie, they thought it could have been way more clear. And I thought that would not be as good if it was. No, because the whole point it's, it's, it's that lack of closure. I know one person that was like, what are you talking about? Suicide. I didn't get the movie. I'm like, what? Okay. (laughs) Uh, But I, it would have way less than the impact, obviously, if it was more clear and it wasn't just like a realistic depiction of piecing shit together. But Anyway, I think it's very powerful in that way. Great filmmaking. Great way to convey 11-year-old emotions. Yeah, a <laughs> big bummer. <laughs> to, <laughs> not a movie you throw on with your friends, like a summer laid-back movie <laughs> like we've been talking, but, you know, whatever. Uh, anyway, final thoughts on After Sun. Man, I, I think I've said it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Really, really looking forward to uh, whatever Charlotte Wells. Hell yeah. Does next? I'll probably seek out. Uh, Paul Mescal was in that movie All of Us Strangers that came out not too long ago. I need to see that. This is a top ten for me of the 2020s of films. So if you've listened to this, I hope you've watched it. But go check it out. I don't know why my computer keeps messing up, but hey, here I am. Thanks for listening, everybody. We've got plenty of other summer series episodes. If you miss it, if you're trying to catch up, you know, summer's still going. Still got a few more weeks, at least in the States. I know kids go back to school in the next week or two, but, you know. Yeah. And if you're in Australia, fuck you. (laughs) Fuck your weather. Yeah. Hope hope your state freaking burns, yo. We got uh, like 150 episodes on here. Go check them out. Support us, you know. Do whatever you need. We've got a tie-in film. I've got a book for sale. That's the real way to support the channel. Buy my book. Watch Scott on Instagram. Do comedy bits. You can follow him at Scott K Comedy on Instagram. I'm The Mooring Line, which is our other channel. Go check that out. Thanks for listening, everybody. Next week, we'll be back with our regularly scheduled harbor programming. We'll see you next week. Goodbye.